Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge. Thank you, Alexis, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Alexis, before I introduce today's very special guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Um, I recently learned that our tower, um, which is named in honor of Miss Barbara Lynn Tanner Cooper, it's the tallest building in Northwest Tennessee which I didn't know. Um, And also when you're going up our elevator, it takes you 13 stories in 12 seconds. Well, there you go. That's that's um, flying high is a very good uh, fact for you to share today since um, we've got a really special guest, Katie Burke, who's a curator with Ducks Unlimited. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, um, you and I have talked uh, quite a bit um, about waterfowl and, yep. and conservation in the past few months as we've been working together on an exhibit. But um, I'm most interested uh, to start off with you personally. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where you came from and um, the path that led you to Ducks Unlimited. Uh, it's kind of a long one. Uh, well, Ducks Unlimited it was short. But the actual job is long. So I grew up in Charleston, Mississippi, which is in Tallahatchie County. Um, It's a big duck hunting um, area. And um, I grew up duck hunting and... How old old were you when you went duck hunting for the very first time and who took it? The first time? Ooh, I don't know. Um, Eight or nine. Um, I remember like squirrel hunting as a kid, like four. And like falling asleep on my dad's shoulders. So your oh, dad, yeah. your dad took you uh, hunting. Yeah. Uh, now did you have brothers as well? That he also did he take the whole brood hunting? So yeah. So my sister's the oldest, and that's my brother, and then I'm the youngest. And my sister, he took her originally, and she like was not in, didn't want to do it, like pass. And um, my brother, obviously, he's very into it too, and I hunt with him still, um, and his kids. But so he went and like early remember my earliest memories are, squ- are squirrel hunting with him and my dad and he would be the one actually hunting and then I would like just be right my dad would just carry me around <laughs> and I'd fall asleep and I'd wake up and we'd be like leaving. Um, so basically I would hunt a little bit here and there and then as my brother got older he got too cool to hunt with my dad. So um, he would go hunt with friends and then my dad was like well I got this one here. So he would take me and I got to be his buddy for a long time. And that's kind of how I fell in love with duck hunting and turkey hunting. I did all of, I did all the things. Um, and now I primarily just duck hunt and turkey hunt. Now, a lot of the folks listening maybe have never hunted. So what is it uh, that, that you think uh, lit, lit your spark there on hunting at such an early age, especially? Um, I don't think it was hunting per se. Um, I think it was a love of the outdoors, of watching the sun come up, the beauty of the ducks swarming around a uh, duck blind. I don't really think it really had so much to do with actual hunting um, as much as it did about experiencing just kind of God's creation with my dad and my brother. Um, It's kind of an emotional connection with that Um, and I still like before like when I'm in the duck blind and I'm standing there out in the water and before we're shooting ducks before it's shooting time I still kind of have this emotional reaction to that no matter if I'm duck hunting or turkey hunting like just it's something I don't even really know how to describe it but it's just this connection you have um like your body with nature and it's it's kind of a beautiful and I've heard other hunters say the same thing it's just kind of this surreal connection that you can kind of have 
And as we've been working on this exhibit, I hear that over and over and over again from people that, you know, their love of hunting, you know, a lot of it is around the relationships that are developed, the, you know, the buddies, the husband and wife, the families, you know, that you hear that over and over and over again. Yeah. And duck hunting is, is special in a certain way for that. Um, you know, the reasons I love duck hunting aren't the same reasons I love turkey hunting because duck hunting is a social activity like you can talk you don't have to necessarily be super quiet um we kind of can talk about our lives and what's going on and we it's a time for us to catch up with each other whereas in like deer hunting and turkey hunting it's you have to be quiet and it's a much more serious thing so it's it's a little bit different where duck hunting does have that social aspect to it yeah, I remember hunting with my dad and having him not get on to me, but have him continually try to tell me to quit crunching so loud <laughs> as I would walk because I would alert all the, the animals within 10 miles. Yeah, um, Alexis, have you ever been hunting before? I have not. I've never been hunting. We need to take Alexis. Luke, I know you have, right? Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what do you duck hunt, Luke? I don't think I know this. You know what's funny? I've lived like five minutes from Real Foot Lake my whole life. I've never been duck hunting, but I've deer, I've deer hunted, turkey hunted, squirrel hunted, all that stuff. Well, we're gonna have to uh, take you and um, Alexis uh, duck hunting one day. So, um, so and tell me again um, where you where you were growing up during this time. So I grew up yeah in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi. So it's about an hour south of Memphis, um, down fifty five, and it's just like a three thousand person town it's very small um famous because morgan freeman's from there that's about all we got um but it's just a small town and my dad grew up there um my whole family was from there so i grew up there and i grew up hunting and then my dad is very involved in ducks limited he has been my whole life so i grew up in ducks unlimited um with a dad for a volunteer and he was he was I guess state chairman, which is like the head volunteer, like each state has a state chairman, which is like the lead volunteer um, for Ducks Limited in each state. And I think he was state chairman when I was middle school. So we would go, we started going to national convention, which is this huge event for Ducks Limited, like volunteer celebrated event. And it changes location each year. But um, we went, started going when I was probably like 10. And I went all the way through high school. So I've been part of the DU family my entire life. Um, but that is not what I was wanting to do with my career. Like I had no idea that I would end up back here. Like I, that wasn't the trajectory I was on at that time. And you ended up far away going yes. uh, to school. Um, talk to me a little bit about where you went to school and what you majored in. Yeah, so I started off at Ole Miss, which was nearby, and then I had an art history and history degree. And then um, while I was there, I uh, worked for the University Museum, and that's when I fell in love with the museums and museum work. So I decided at Ole Miss that that's what I wanted to do, and um, I applied to a bunch of different schools, but I got into University of the Arts in Philadelphia. And so... I don't know if your audience says this, but museum programs are usually like museum studies. And that's kind of like the typical degree you would get as a master in museums. So you'd get like a museum studies degree or a public history degree or something like that. But UArts is a little unique in that it takes the museum studies um, degree and it splits it in three. So you could either do exhibit design education or communications and communications was kind of like a catch-all so like you would do either collections curatorial development uh advertising it kind of had like a little bit of everything and you could focus like you could choose your focus so i did that and i focused on curatorial and collections management um and that was yeah in philadelphia and um, I loved there, it. There wasn't there wasn't a lot of hunting in Philadelphia. I'm oh no, none. So I didn't do any hunting when I was there. I would come home and hunt over Christmas and Easter and things like that. Um, mostly when I was in Philadelphia, I was like a professional intern. Like so, <laughs> I um, if anyone's familiar of what it's like to work in museums, this is kind of your typical, I would say, trajectory. But I got the thing I liked about UArts that I liked more than other schools was 
it was very practical. Like you had to, you had to work a lot. So, and that was part of our curriculum. So you would work and then during the, so you'd have your schoolwork and everything was like, because all of our teachers were museum professionals. So most of our classes were after five, they were in the evening. And um, you would have to do internships that were a part of your curriculum. So you had to do 10 hours a week at a museum or institution within this in the area. Um, and you had to switch per semester. So you weren't supposed to stay at the same place. You're supposed to move around, try different museums, try different locations. So I, I moved around, did a bunch of different projects that um, some I love, some were not so great, but some that really taught me a lot. And then um, I stayed in Philadelphia after that for about five or six years and um, was a professional intern for about three years after school until I finally got a full-time job. And that's, you know, that's pretty typical for museums to have to like work your way. It's not a lot of museum jobs out there, so you kind of have to play the play the field until you finally get in. Yep. And then and then while you were there, I love the fact that you uh found a guy to date who knew how to shoot a gun, right? Yeah, I did. So so Andrew, my husband, um yeah, I met him through match.com of all things. So <laughs> and um he knew nothing about hunting though. He randomly was on like the rifle team in his hometown in Massachusetts, so he knew how to shoot a gun. Um, and honestly, that was like the best thing about him, like not like about that part of him, because I had dated all these guys from the Mississippi Delta and I'd take them hunting and I could out shoot them or out hunt them. And they were, they'd get really like uptight and heard about it, like that their girlfriend was better than them at hunting. And I would get so annoyed because it would just be frustrating. But like he had no hunting background, but he could shoot pretty good. So he didn't care that I was better than him at that. Like he was like, of course you're better than me. I don't know what I'm doing. Like this is not, this is completely new to me. So that was actually really nice. It kind of like took that whole pressure thing off the, off that part of our relationship. And he was just so like, you know, he's from Massachusetts. When you come from Massachusetts to the Delta, it's pretty culture shock. So he was just shocked by like all the things that were happening. <laughs> Well, I know your uh, family was probably relieved when you brought this uh, Massachusetts guy down south, and turns out he knew how to shoot a gun at least. Yeah, and he was willing to do it, and happy to do it. He thought it was fun. And, yeah, he was. And does do y'all still hunt together? Does he still hunt? Yeah, he duck hunts a lot. He likes to duck hunt. You know, we have three kids now, little kids, so we are kind of like we don't get to hunt together as much anymore. We're kind of like trading off a little bit, but you know that's. Like, as I say, a season of life, we'll get back to be able to go at the same time and go with our kids. But um, he goes a good bit, and we take turns. He'll go with my dad, and then I'll go with my dad. And um, it's, yeah, he does hunt a lot. Now, he has not gotten into the turkey hunting, but he likes to duck hunt. Now, up in, up in um, our neck of the woods, as you know, people duck hunt in blinds that are, you know, well preserved and created right. and they have ovens and stoves yeah. and they make breakfasts and you know it's a it's a big affair how about in your where you're duck hunting is it the same style no i mean there's a little bit of that um so it depends on where you are like um some of these places like we used to hunt um you could you would do that because you had these more established bonds or more established duck hunting holes so they've the trees are bigger and things like that where we hunt now actually um so our property we bought my dad bought i say we i didn't buy anything um <laughs> was about 10 12 years ago and it was completely like uh formed land like it was all cleared for soybeans so no trees barely on it maybe like a ditch row with a few trees but it was completely formed farmland um just flat so when he bought it, he put a WRP on it, and um, basically what that is is he turned it into a permanent easement. Ducks Limited came in, and they reformed that land to become a wetlands, and they planted trees and um, plants on there to re like reestablish it as a working wetland, and it's protected now, so it can never be turned back into uh, and cleared for farm. So our holes are like we don't have nearly as big as trees and things like that. So we're kind of standing in the water along tree lines, 
hunting. Um, hopefully one day we'll be in blinds again, you know, as it, it matures and becomes a more established place. But no, it's a little, it's a little more rugged than, uh, than a uh, real foot. So and- the, the big question is how did you end up, uh, from in Philadelphia, in a, in a Philadelphia, uh, were you in Philadelphia? Is that yep. where you were when you ended up getting recruited to come back yep. down South permanently? Was, yes. So I was working at the independent seaport museum. Uh, I was the education and what was my title? Education and volunteer coordinator there. So I ran all family programs. Um, there was two coordinators. So there's like one who did just like STEM programs. And then I did all the other like history and family programs and then um, volunteer, I ran the volunteer program. So I was working there. And um, while I was there, a good family friend at Ducks Unlimited was telling me about this idea of putting a museum in the pyramid. And um, actually I was on a hunt, I was at our camp and he was like, I'm gonna bring you the plans. So he came and brought the plans and he showed them to me. And he's like, can you like make some notes on this? And I'm like, I looked at it, you could tell no museum person had looked at these plans. I mean, it was like um, they had a real fireplace in the museum. Can you imagine a real fireplace inside of a museum? Yeah, which which we both know you cannot do that. Yes. Um, why don't you also uh, expound upon the fact that you said a museum in the pyramid? So a lot of listeners may not even, me being a Memphian, I get it. Uh, but a lot of folks are like thinking, what is she talking about? So, yeah, the Memphis Pyramid was originally built to be a basketball arena and um, concert venue and that sort of thing. So, and I guess it was 2004, they closed it and because they built the FedEx Forum, which is where the Grizzlies play now and where all the concerts are. So it was abandoned from 2004 until, I guess this was 2000 and like 15. 15, yeah. Um, and um, Johnny Morris bought it, the owner of Bass Pro Shops, and he decided to turn it into a Bass Pro Shop. So inside there, they built a the one of the, the second largest Bass Pro Shop. They put in a bowling alley. They put in a hotel. And they also put in a Ducks Limited Museum. So we have um, about 4,000 square foot of um, museum space inside the on the second floor of the um, inside of a Bass Pro Shop. Now, when you looked at those plans, um, how far along were they? Were you able to sort of apply some museum best practices early on, or were they too far down the down the line? They were no, I could because they were mostly on like a look and feel. Um, there were definitely some things that I had like put in that they. I guess they had, I didn't realize they had already like chosen cases and things like that. So the cases were like not ideal. I mean, they're great, but they're not what I would have chosen, but they're still really nice and beautiful. Um, There's a lot of like more aesthetic things. Like they were thinking more of a making it beautiful space versus a museum space. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it is very beautiful. And probably, of course, I've been to Johnny Morris's world of wonder. Yes. um, And, and it's, I mean, it's stunning, you know, in the, you know, the way that they've got some things displayed is, you know, breathtaking. And so that's probably what they were thinking, you know, is to your, to your point, the aesthetics, you know, rather than the artifacts. Yes. And prior to, so we were the second space they had created. So in their home store, they have an NRA museum and that was the first one. So they were used to that for displaying guns, which is a very specific way you would do it. And that's all they have there. So they, that's our cases aren't that different from that. Um, And then by the time they get to wonders of wildlife, you can tell they've like, learned again like you know they're definitely in a learning process because all their stuff is fabricated in house which is crazy like they have an all, their own fabricators through Bass Pro so and they do incredible work but they did like silly things like putting a wood burning fireplace like no one's gonna loan you anything with fire just going on <laughs> inside of your museum so and then they had like like weird flow things going on that you just don't think about. Um, one of my favorite things that people don't think about and is like how kids will like, uh, like do things with like, like I was a lot of it's like kids are going to break that 
they're also going to break that. They're going to break that too. Like, you know, they break. You got to think about what a nine year old boy is going to do with something. Are they going to, because they're most likely going to throw their body on top of it and <laughs> snap it off. Like, if you now, were it, you officially on the team yet, or were they no. still uh, so I was just recruiting you? Yeah, no, they weren't recruiting me at all. So they were just, I knew this guy and I was happy to help. And they were just, he was just sending me stuff on the side and I would write notes and I'd send it back. And I was like, so what are you going to do with this? Like, what is your plan? Who's going to run it? And they were like, I have no idea. So every six months for about three years, I would just like send my resume updated and be like, oh, you know, just in case, like I could, you could call me. And then they called me. One day they finally called me and, um, you know, we talked for a while about what they were looking for and they hired me and the, the role has changed a little bit since then, but not a whole lot. And, um, yeah, it was just like a perfect fit. So we moved down and here we are. And so when we get back from the break, I want you to kind of walk me through verbally through the museum a little bit and share uh, some of what, what visitors would find if they visited there. I'm a huge fan. When I uh, go to Memphis and, and to see friends and family or whatever, I always like to stay in the pyramid if there's uh rooms available because it's such a great place to stay and it's so much fun to sit out on the balcony and look at the empty uh retail space um you know it's really uh something about that i just really love so um, we'll be right back in one minute The Realfoot National Wildlife Refuge was established about 15 miles southwest of Discovery Park to manage the upper third of Realfoot Lake as a refuge for migratory birds. There, you'll find a wintering ground for waterfowl and bald eagles. They host multiple activities throughout the spring, summer, and fall, including the annual youth fishing rodeo, junior ranger camp, various workshops, archery programs, guided canoe trips, eagle tours, and more. For their complete schedule, Google Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Katie Burke, who goes by the title of curator, um, but I know that she wears a lot of hats, um, one of them being a cheerleader of the exhibit there um, at the Bass Pro Shop in the Pyramid in Memphis. So, Katie, walk us through a little bit um, of what folks will experience when they come to your museum. Yeah, no problem. So when you, we're on the second floor, so you will go through the um, pyramid retail, like the bottom floor to come up to ours, and you'll even see live ducks down there. They have ponds with rainbow trout and catfish and sturgeon and big cypress trees, like literally life-size cypress trees. I mean, they're not real, but life-size cypress trees are literally in the store, um, and you'll walk upstairs and we're right there when you go up the stairs. So when you walk into the museum, it's got like an upscale hunting lodge feel, our one, our first gallery. And I'd say a very upscale um, hunting lodge feel. It's much nicer than one, any one I've been in. But you go in and it's got, you know, lounge chairs and a, uh, not a real fireplace, a fake fireplace and taxidermy. And um, it just has a very like warm environment feel. And in that space, um, so all of our exhibits are, I'd say, I'd say about like 60% of them are on loan. So we rotate exhibits um, collections reg like on a yearly basis. So I, and not all at the same time, but they're mostly on loan from private collectors. Um, there's a very large um, collecting, like waterfowl collecting community out there. Um, and it's its own world in itself. It's a whole nother topic. But because of that, I have almost infinite resources for getting collections into the museum and being able to trade those out and provide um, new objects for people to see, which is great because we're a small space and I want people whenever they come back to have something new to see. So when you first walk in, I usually have um, a duck call collection there. Currently we have a Minnesota duck call collection. So different states um, 
have like there's a few states that are really big with duck calls um and one of those happened to be real foot real foot is actually a style of duck call um and so we always have a duck call display there and that's on loan from a private collector also within that space i have um a very uh rare big bore gun collection so most people are used to sh like 12 gauge uh 12 gauge 20 gauge shotguns but big bore would be something like two four and six gauge guns um and maybe eight gauge guns these are all guns that are now illegal to shoot but um those will be there then you kind of move through to another space it's also part of the lodge and we have decorative decoys and um, original sporting art on display that also changes out. And we had decorative decoys. So there are decoys we call gutting decoys. So these are decoys that you would literally shoot over and hunt. Um, and they can also be known as art now. But did you have decorative, and these are made strictly as art. These weren't made with any intention to be shot over. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have a decorative, and then you walk into the other space, and then we have our history, um, the Ducks Limited history, um, going, you know, starting back with our formation, and that really ties a lot into the country's history as well. Um, it kind of starts with the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. And, and I'd love, I'd love for you to spend a little bit of time um, as we talk about this, also explaining. This will help people understand what is Ducks Unlimited because, you know, probably most people have heard of Ducks Unlimited yeah. by this point, but a lot of them probably have no earthly idea what exactly it is. So this would be a good chance to weave that in as well. Yeah. So most people probably think of us as the stickers on backs of people truck trucks or like a clothing brand. But actually, so Ducks Unlimited is a conservation organization. So we got started. Um, there's two two organizations that led to our to Ducks Unlimited. Um, but basically, we were started during um, the Dust Bowl era, a little before that, but the Dust Bowl era. Uh, prior to this, there was something called market hunting. And people would um, shoot ducks basically to sell to restaurants. And there was no limits on ducks. There was no way to really police ducks. So they were shooting out the resource. So ducks were the duck population was dwindling. And then the Dust Bowl happens, and there's major drought across the uh, across North America. So then the duck population even like goes down even further. So a lot of a few sportsmen get together, duck hunters, and they want to save this resource because they are passionate about duck hunting and they want to be able to continue to do it and pass it on to their to their next generation. So they get together to help to form the first. Well, there's two. There's American Wildfowlers that then more game birds, and then Ducks Unlimited. So Ducks Unlimited is formed in 1937 um, by a few hunters. And they basically decide when we begin, uh, when we were more game birds, we started trying to raise ducks. We did, it's called the European method, and release them. And we quickly learned that that wasn't effective in the country. It just really wasn't helping the populations. Those ducks would soon die off and they wouldn't like establish in the country. So then we moved Ducks Unlimited to be a bigger organization, and we work primarily in Canada. And the reason we work in Canada is because we call it the Duck Factory Canada, because that is where ducks breed and mate and bring up their young. So we're saving uh, land and habitat in Canada um, to help bring the, that duck population back up. Um, and we do that up until the 80s. Actually, the first uh, land project isn't in the United States until 1984. Um, so all that money was going, all the money that was raised by duck hunters throughout the country was going back to Canada. And, and so, how was that money raised? So that's a unique thing to Ducks Lemon. We're kind of like the beginners of the event dinners, you know, like when you go to a charity event and they auction things off. Well, Ducks Lemon kind of started it all. We're kind of like... If there was a patent, we should have it. So we kind of started that dinner, and we called them sportsman dinners. And duck hunters would get together in areas where they hunted, and um, they'd come together, eat, auction off items that they that the volunteers themselves put together, and then they would send that money back to uh, the organization in Canada. And then it kind of grew further, and that states would get really competitive, and they started this thing where they would name 
um, lakes after states. Um, so they would like they could, they would compete to get a lake, and then it got really competitive, and that's how we raised more money, and it just kept evolving, and after that, and becoming this big thing. And then obviously, as we have kind of reestablished this um, this Canadian habitat, we realized you know ducks travel; they aren't they aren't just staying there. They have to have wintering grounds. They migrate, so we want to start saving and protecting land all along that migration pattern. And we continue to do that. Now we have, not only do we have Ducks Limited Canada and Ducks Limited Inc. for United States, we also have Ducks Limited Mexico. So we're kind of protecting their habitat all across North America. And for anyone who's not aware, Discovery Park is in the heart of the Mississippi Flyway. Um, so so here in uh, Obion County, we, we'll see geese and waterfowl and, and I mean, by the hundreds and hundreds stopping over. Um, it never ceases to amaze me. I, I'm probably going to get shot myself because I'm constantly trying to pull over and get out of my car and get as close to them as I can without them all flying away. So, um, it's, and, and just up in the sky every day, all day long this time of the year, I'm just seeing them flying all around. You know, yeah. it's, it's crazy how many we have here. Yeah. And y'all's history too. I mean, and I'm excited. Like, about the exhibit too, because that history of real foot and that area of Byron County is such a rich, rich history of waterfowling um, in general, not just with Ducks Illuminated, but all the way back to market hunters to conservation today. It's it's one of the one of the richer areas. For this would be a good time too for you to talk a little bit about the duck stamp. Um, yeah. I, I always, you know, I was a little bit aware of the duck stamp, and I always until recently assumed it was a stamp that was sold to people to put on letters and that they would, that's how money was made, but that is not the case. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, happy to. So ducks, the duck stamp actually predates ducks unlimited. Um, and one of my favorite, um, characters in waterfowling history is Ding Darling, Jay Ding Darling. And he was put on a committee by, um, FDR, President Roosevelt to basically figure out this duck situation. Like why are, why are they dwindling? How can we help save wetland habitats and ducks? And they were kind of put on this, this, it was a team of them to put, and he's kind of the main one, but to figure out the duck situation. So the thing they come up with is the duck stamp. So in, I think it was 1934 is when they released the first duck stamp, it was $1. And when you would purchase that, you had to purchase that to hunt ducks. So um, you also had to purchase it to go onto these properties that they would eventually create. But this, but originally it was to hunt ducks, and you would purchase this property as your license, and that one dollar would go back to, um, I get at the time it wasn't the Fish and Wildlife, but National Fish and Wildlife, but it's their predecessor, and that would go to saving wetlands in North in the United States. So that's another reason why Ducks Limited didn't go to the United States. They went to Canada instead because the duck stamp was already doing work in the prairies of the United States. So they wanted to go and do and help in else place where, where they weren't already having help. So, um, so one of the fun things, like fun facts about the stamp. So that first stamp, it's a pair of mallards like flying in and, um, there's a big art competition that goes around it, which is this whole thing. But that very first stamp, they were trying to decide what would go on the stamp. And um, Jay Ding Darling was a famous cartoonist and political cartoonist. And he was just like, I don't know. And he just sketched something. I was like, I don't know, something like this. And he handed it over. And the next thing he knew, it was the stamp. So <laughs> he had no intention for that being yet, but he just kind of sketched it out real quick and threw it out. I'm like, I don't know, it should look a little bit like this. So that's so funny. <laughs> and it's, and, and the work that's being done by, you know, everybody in conservation is so crucial because I always think about the Labrador duck as an example right. of what can happen if we don't pay attention. And if anybody's listening and curious, Google the story of the Labrador duck because you'll never see it because it's extinct now. And there's um, quite a few things like that. Um, you know, there's certain quail and things like that, you know, and you have to think like holistically about these things because, well, the duck stamp today, just to say, like, you have to buy it to hunt steel. I think it's $27 now, and maybe 26 And then you also have to buy it to go, like, bird watching or anything like that on these properties. But because, like, we're not just 
saving, we're, yes, we're saving duck habitat, but we're saving wetlands. So you're not also just protecting those ducks and geese, but you're protecting all the animals that live on wetlands. And you're helping supply fresh water and drinking water for us. So it's, it's not just, if you save one thing, you're also saving lots of things. Um, and you have to think about, about, you say, oh, I don't care about ducks, but you probably care about clean water too. So that's got to think about it a little broader. And, and another part of that, that is, uh, something we've been working on a little bit is the junior duck stamp, uh, program, uh, address that just a little. Um, I don't know a whole, whole lot about it, but it's basically the similar thing. Um, and it's artists. So I guess to preface that, the duck stamp every year they hold an art competition um and those artists people have to submit a very specific sized painting and they have all these rules that go with it and they submit it to the duck stamp competition and there's like a there's a selected judging staff and they choose it and um and it's picked every year so the junior duck stamp is the same way um there's some they have this set of rules they draw this picture and they submit it in to I think it's a, they're a little more lenient, obviously, on the criteria of what it has to be. But then they have a set of judges, and they're selected as well. And I believe they do a scholarship program for them. When yeah, they, they do. Um, because the Tennessee winners will be gathering here at Discovery Park. We're going to host the awards dinner this year for the junior oh, duck stamp competition for Tennessee. So that's uh, why we've been uh, a little bit involved. Yeah. And I can't wait to see uh, the art that they come up with yeah you know that's a interesting thing and i think it's state by state but um i just know this as a duck hunter but most states have their own duck stamp and they're used primarily as a like fundraising um they're not necessarily like you have to have them sort of thing but uh depends on this it's really state dependent but they're used as a fundraising for conservation um thing and they're usually like they'll get artists from their own state or things like that now back to uh, the museum at the the Bass Pro Shop in the Pyramid in Memphis. What is your number one favorite um, artifact or display? Or if I could only see one thing, what should I make sure I see? So my favorite is something kind of innocuous, but I love it. It's the duck and nickel can. So it doesn't look like much, but it's basically this little tin ca coffee can, and it's got. Um, this mascot who no longer exists, but he was called Jake the Drake. He's got a little cowboy hat on. But I just love, it's kind of this, got this really grassroots feel to how you can fundraise. Like anyway, you can fundraise. Fundraising and successful fundraising can come off anything. And the reason the Duck and Nickel can came to be was because our original general manager, excuse me, <coughs> our original general manager, Tom, Maine, he was general manager for Canada. He like made a statement that he could save a duck for a nickel. So if any if anyone would just give a nickel, he could save a duck. So this chapter in California took that and they made these coffee cans called duck and nickel cans. And they put them in duck clubs and cafes and barber shops and anywhere you'd find duck hunters and it basically was like, if you kill a duck, you put a nickel in the can. And when the can was full, they would send it back to Ducks Unlimited. And that happened primarily in the early 50s, like 1955, like probably mid 50s is when those were really popular. And they're really hard to come by. They're pretty rare because they, you know, like a lot of things, they were just random objects no one cared about and they got thrown away. So there's just not very many of them left. And I just always find them really interesting. I think my one of my favorite uh, things you guys have on display are the duck bands. Um, I think that's really interesting that you can uh, hunt a duck and then when you pick it up out of the water, it has a band. It could have a band around um, yeah. its its leg. So to describe this for non hunters, I guess the easiest way is to compare it to like if you kill a big deer, like in, um, if it's you know like a twelve point or a ten point, like the antlers are like a big thing, you know. So when you duck hunt, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife they, and Ducks Limited and a few other organizations, they ban ducks. And they do this for, um, like, research reasons. They want to know. They ban these ducks. All the bans have a number on them. And when you kill one, you actually call it in and you report the number that's on there. And they'll tell you where they banded it. And they'll ask you questions about where it was killed, 
you know, and like what the day was like, the weather, the how many people, how many ducks you killed, that sort of thing. And they take that information for research purposes. Um, but one of the funny things about those bands, so when we were putting them on display, bands have the numbers obviously on them and people will call them in and such things. And when we were putting them out, because they were all donated, these are unused bands from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but they're real bands and they have real numbers on them and you can call them in. And we had to make sure that none of the bands, you could fully see the full number so people wouldn't just be claiming them. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's also um, it's also fascinating. You alluded to it a little bit, but just how much research goes into um, the the life of waterfowl, where they go, their behavior, how it evolves, and how it changes, and and how many people are focused on making sure that both you know the environment. And, you know, th that we continue to have waterfowl um, based on uh, the research that's happening. Yeah. You know, and lately, I mean, our, my uh, fellow podcast host, Dr. Mike Brazier, obviously can speak on this more. But the education behind that has really um, blossomed over the last, like, 10, 10 years. Um, there's been more waterfowl biologist, biology programs out there in universities. Um, it's definitely become, and Ducks Lippin now has a scholarship for that as well. Um, it's definitely really grown as a field and um, more people are going into it. It's really interesting. And so I know that uh, you and I and several people at Ducks Unlimited, along with George Dunklin, who's the founder and owner of Five Oaks Duck Lodge and a former president of yeah. Ducks Unlimited, um, and multiple other people from our two organizations have been working on this um, exhibit called Duck, Duck, Goose, Waterfowl of the Mississippi Flyway that will open later in uh, 2023. Um, obviously, a lot of our visitors are, are not necessarily waterfowl hunters or conservationists. What's one thing that you would ho hope that they would leave with um, knowing that they didn't know when they arrived? I think the one thing like that I get, I guess, the most questions about as the museum, and I think people are most confused by, is that Yes, Ducks Unlimited, we are primarily, we are a conservation organization. We are saving wetlands and habitat for ducks and geese. But we are supported by hunters. And people usually, often, I would say mostly, are very confused by that relationship. And I guess I would want people to realize that hunters don't want to deplete the resource. You know, that's, that's why they support us because... Um, they put their money where their passion is, and they want to see that resource be around forever. They want it to be there for themselves, for their kids and their grandkids, and that's how we were formed. We were formed by hunters, and we continue to be sustained by hunters, and they tend to be some of the best outdoorsmen and conservationists out there. So my last question for you is, um, do any of your three children show a propensity for wanting to become hunters? Well, I have, I can tell you a funny story. <laughs> so I took them over Christmas break. We were, we spent most of our Christmas break at our duck camp with my, my whole family, uh, my sister and brother and their kids and my parents. And um, my daughter is six and my son is three. And he really wanted to, my three-year-old son really wanted, my other son is seven months old, so he's not going hunting. <laughs> but, um, my three-year-old son really wanted to go and he just couldn't be quiet. So I just drove the truck up and let him sit in the truck and he ate snacks. But that was most of his hunting. And then um, my daughter, I took her um, deer hunting and she's still a little young. I took them both duck hunting, but the problem with duck hunting when you're that little is like the water and having to wear waders. They just don't have like the right gear for them. So it's harder to take them duck hunting until they get a little older. So I took her deer hunting and I was like, oh, this is easy. We'll just sit there. If we see some deer, I mean, I really wasn't planning on shooting anything. I just wanted her to kind of have the experience and see deer walk around. And we're in there and she's sitting and she's being really cute and quiet and she's eating her snacks. She's got her iPad. I mean, they have it so easy now. They just sit up there and look at an iPad, <laughs> her iPad. And I won't let her, she's eating snacks, but she keeps putting her hand in the bag and rustling the chips. So I keep handing her chips one by one as she eats. And she goes, mommy. It's like, yes, Louise. She's like, are they just going to come out in ones and twos? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Honey. They're just, 
I, maybe. <laughs> and she's like, okay, I think they'll come out in once. And I was like, all right. And she goes, there's one. <laughs> And she points to one and she goes, is that a mommy or a daddy, dear? And, I <laughs> <laughs> and she was so anxious for me. She wanted me to shoot so bad. I was like, no, we're not just going to shoot a random deer. We don't need to shoot a deer. Like, we're just here to just to see them and watch them. And she was disappointed in the end. She got, she wanted me to shoot really bad. She didn't get to take us some antlers to hang up <laughs> yeah. on, the, on the wall. Well, thank you so much for, for uh, giving me your time. And thank you for working with us on this exhibit. I'm, I'm so excited about getting to finally uh, get it open. Yeah, I'm really excited too. I can't wait to be there and see all the excitement and see people kind of introduced to waterfowl. That'll be fun. And thanks to all of you listeners who've joined Katie, Alexis, Luke, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. 